Okay, um, I'd like to now speak about line defects, plane defects, and microscopy to finish off chapter four um, from your material science textbook. So first, line defects, or a uh, basically a one-dimensional defect, are dislocations. They're called dislocations. And what happens is slip between crystal planes actually results when dislocations move. So you have a line defect. It's moving along. This dislocation is moving along. And this causes um, or produces permanent plastic deformation. So there's two kinds of deformation when something is deformed. It can deform plastically, which means it's permanently deformed, kind of like smushing a piece of silly putty or plastic. Or it can deform elastically. In other words, you stretch a rubber band and it bounces right back. So plastic deformation is permanently altering the material. So for example, um, if you look at this zinc um, hexagonal closed pack lattice and you deform it, then what will happen is it will stretch out and then when it stretches out, the uh, relaxation of the lattice happens along very specific slip directions um, and it causes really cool looking effects that are pictured in your textbook. Now. Um, we, th we talk about the Burgers vector and uh, linear defects um, in terms of the Burgers vector. So basically, if you have a one-dimensional defect, um, then that can be when the atoms are misaligned, and that can be the beginning of your slip plane. So the Burgers vector, which is often abbreviated um, with a lowercase b, it is a vector, so it has a direction, and it's named after the Dutch physicist Jan Berger. Um, and the magnitude and the direction is best understood from this little graphic that you see here. So this perfect lattice right here, um, you can see, makes this perfect little rectangle. But now, if we introduce a defect here, um, which is symbolized sometimes with that little you know, perpendicular insert for an edge dislocation is symbolized by that little T, um, then what happens is it stretches your rectangle out, it distorts your rectangle. Now the direction and the magnitude of the distortion of the rectangle will give you the Burgers vector. So here, because your rectangle is basically opened up in this direction, the Burgers vector points along that and connects um, the original rectangle to the new stretched out rectangle, so it kind of completes it in. In other words, if you have to splice a new little wire in to finish out your rectangle, the Burgers vector would be the slice. Now that's for an edge dislocation. Down here we show a screw dislocation, which is basically taking the planes and shearing them this way and introducing a defect there. Um, it's a little more three-dimensional than two-dimensional. So you can see here you have this perfect little rectangle, and then what happens is the rectangle gets torqued like that. Okay, When the rectangle gets torqued like that, then the Burgers vector, um, which completes that rectangle, uh, connects the rectangle that's opened in this direction. So the Burgers vector points perpendicular to the plane um, uh, of the uh, atoms, the original atoms. Okay, so in edge dislocation, the Burgers vector and the dislocation line are actually at right angles to one another, but in screw dislocations, they're parallel, if that makes sense. Okay, so here's uh, an example of an edge dislocation, and that's basically when you have an extra half plane of atoms inserted into a crystalline structure. So you have extra atoms inserted in. The dislocation line is parallel to that extra half plane of atoms, and then the Burgers vector is perpendicular. So the extra half plane of atoms run this way in that diagram, and the Burgers vector points that way, so they're perpendicular to one another. Okay, hopefully that's... Uh, that's clear, and that's why edge dislocations are often symbolized with the little symbol that we use for perpendicular. Okay, here's a, um, an image, a TEM image, of an edge dislocation. So you can see I'm not making this up. Um, this was taken uh, from a lead um, telluride sample here, and then a, a and antimony telluride sample below, and you can see that there, there's a lattice mismatch there, um, and that causes that extra line of atoms to go along. And because the lattice mismatch is very regular, if you looked at a zoomed out photo, you could see that the extra, um, extra line gets inserted in a regularly spaced fashion across the whole image.
Now what happens is if you place your material under some kind of stress, you apply a force to it, and then that force is spread out over the area of the material producing a stress, then what happens is your edge dislocation can actually move or migrate under that stress, okay? So for example, in this um, cartoon here, what's happened is you have a crystalline lattice and it's being sheared. So the top is being pushed one way and the bottom is being pushed another. And that introduces that stress and that causes the plane of atoms that is that dislocation to hop along and move through. So it, it actually moves through like that. There's a movie depicting that in a two-dimensional way here. Let me show that movie. And you can also go back to the uh, slides on your own and see how they move around and hop. And they do that actually to minimize their energy. So what happens is when the force is applied, that adds a little bit of energy to the system, enabling the atoms to move to a more energetically favorable configuration. I'll play the movie one more time. And you can see them kind of ha hopping along and the dislocation moving through. Okay, so what's required for that to happen is bonds across the slipping planes are then broken and then reformed with new atoms in succession as it moves across. Okay, so for screw dislocations, what happens is if you, they're called screw dislocation because if you had a succession of them all in a row, of course it would form a screw. Um, and that is a planar ramp that results from a shear deformation. And there we have our Burgers vector parallel to the dislocation line. So in other words, the dislocation causes that plane of atoms to pull out of the cube. And because you would have to draw a line since your rectangle shears this way, the Burgers vector will point in the same direction um, that the dislocation is. Okay, so it's parallel. Um, if you're confused about what these things might look like in three dimensions, there's some um, apps available to you through your textbook. Hopefully you can still access that even though you purchased it used, but if not, you could Google them. And then that will enable you to do a three-dimensional rotation of the crystal so that you can see what the different dislocations look like to um, all sides, from all sides. And you can even see the animations if you want to do that. So that's kind of fun. I encourage you to do that. Now, it's not like you just have edge dislocations or screw dislocations. You can also have any combination of the two um, in a real material. Um, that's depicted here in this cartoon. So you can have edge dislocations, screw dislocations, and mixed dislocations. I'm not making this up. You can actually see these dislocations um, in electron micrographs. So in order to do this, um, you have to make a really thin section of your metal and stick it in a transmission electron microscope. And then they'll pop out as darker spots on your image. And the reason for that is that as the electrons move through the crystalline lattice, of course, they're diffracted a little bit. And they diffract one way through a perfect lattice, and then they diffract in a slightly different angle when they hit a di dislocation because the density is different for the atoms at dislocations. Um, and because the density is different and they're diffracted in a different direction, that makes the dislocations themselves appear dark or shadowed. Um, and so you can see that. In a TEM, they appear, these dislocations appear um, at magnifications from anywhere from 50,000 to 300,000 times. Now, if you know anything about electron microscopy, you might be saying to yourself, well, I don't need a TEM to see something like that. A scanning electron microscope is plenty good um, enough to see that magnification, and that's true. But in order to see the dislocations, you generally have to shoot the electrons through the material, and that's why a TEM is required, even though the magnification is relatively low um, compared to what TEMs can do in millions of magnification. Okay, now. We've discussed dislocations, but the process by which a dislocation actually moves and causes the material to permanently plastically deform is called slip. Okay, this is called slip. So the direction that the dislocation moves in is, term, is termed the slip direction. And the slip direction will be in the direction of the Berger's vector um, for edge dislocations. So during slip, the edge dislocation actually uh, sweeps out a slip plane that's formed by the Berger's vector and the dislocation for edge dislocations. Okay, so because the, um, the Berger's vector is perpendicular um, for edge dislocations, that sweeps out a plane. Okay.
Now, when it comes to the slip direction, um, you might be thinking, well, which way does it go? Generally, um, what happens is that the close packed directions and planes are preferred for slip. Um, and this makes sense because along a close packed direction, you have more atoms per unit length, and then um, it means that it's less distance for each of those little atoms to hop. If you picture the movie, if there was a longer distance between those um, lattice sites, then it would have to hop further. So it makes difference, makes sense that the uh, close pack direction would be the preferred direction for the slip. Um, and that leads to the smallest expenditure of energy. So as an example, we can calculate the length of the Burgers vector in copper, okay? So if you look up what the um, lattice structure of cop copper is, it's an FCC or a face-centered cubic um, lattice. Now the, um, the direction with the closest packing in FCC is along one of the diagonals of the faces. Okay. Now, of course, the family of directions would be the same. Um, it would be close packed along any of those diagonals of the faces. That's the tightest. Um, this dictates a family of directions. The family of direction is indicated by these sort of triangular looking brackets, greater than, less than brackets here. That's a family of direction. So we're going to call the family the 110 direction um, to, uh, as depicted in this little cartoon here across the bottom. That's the close packed direction. So that's the direction. Now, the um, length of the vector, the length of the Burgers vector, would be the shortest hopping distance across that close pack direction. Um, so, in other words, if the atom were to hop, it would have to hop from this top left corner to the center, for example. And that is going to be, that distance is going to be two times the radius of your atom. So for copper, the atomic radius is 0.128. Um, so double that and you have a length for your Burgers vector of 0.256. And then, so the length is 0.256 and the direction is 110 and that specifies your Burgers vector. Okay, now slip and slippage in metals help explain why the strength of metals is so much lower than the value that you might guess looking at the strength of the metallic bonds. So for example, if you had to break an iron bar and you had to break all the bonds along the whole cross section in order to do that, you'd never be able to break the bond because you'd have to exert a force of several million pounds per square inch to get that to happen. But instead what happens is you deform the bar by causing slip and then only a tiny fraction of those bonds actually have to be broken to break the bar. And that allows you to use a force of like 10,000 pounds per square inch um, in order to, to break the bar. Um, that's also the reason that metals um, in general have a tendency to be more ductile because they have these easy to deform slip planes and that allows you to stretch them out um, and form them into wires. <clears throat> to prove to you that I'm not making this up, these are some images of some fractured um, surfaces. So these surfaces have been fractured and you can see that the cracking actually started along these grain boundaries. So here um, the length scale, the, the scale bar there is 25 microns, 20 microns. So these are the grains and you can see that the fracture started along the boundaries of these gra grains. Um, and of course a grain boundary is a defect so it's easy for slip to start at the defect site. This is just sort of fun to think about. If you think about the density of the dislocations or the slips, then the length this is the length of the dislocation per unit volume. So if you went think back to that picture that we had, the TEM cross section um, showing the little lines. So this would be the total length of all those little lines per unit volume of your material. For the softest metals, this is about a million centimeters per cubic centimeter. Um, and it can have densities of up to 10 to the 12 centimeters per cubic centimeter um, if you deform the material. So most metals are absolutely packed with dislocations and line defects. You can also have planar defects or so-called interfacial defects, and these occur at boundaries. Um, so, for example, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but 
the outside of a metal is actually one great big defect because there's no metals touching it, no metal atoms touching it on the other side. So the surface is actually considered a defect in material science. Um, so external surfaces, grain boundaries are also considered defects because the lattice doesn't match up there. Um, phase boundaries, things like that. Um, domain walls and ferromagnetic materials, these are all different kinds of defects that are basically planar defects and not line defects. So you can have planar defects or grain boundaries caused by a series of um, edge dislocations. You can see here we have a crystalline orientation of one direction on one side and a crystalline orientation of another on the other side and that causes this grain boundary that has crystalline orientations that are different by that specified angle. Okay, And that's because of the series of edge dislocations. You can also see that here. So this is a, another um, electric electron micrograph showing these two materials meeting up and the angle of misalignment. So what's happening here is at the top you have nickel and silicon alloy and then here at the bottom you just have silicon and what that causes is these series of edge dislocations that causes an angle of uh, uh, to form here at the boundary because of a misfit of about 15 percent. So that's pictured there in that um, electron micrograph. Um, planar defects, defects of course, have um, higher chemical reactivities, which means that um, for things like a catalyst, a catalyst is a material that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without actually being consumed itself. So you add catalysts to speed up chemical reactions. Um, catalysts, active sites at catalysts are often at um, grain boundaries or defects. Um, so normally they're surface defects. And this is because the atoms of the defects are in a higher energy state than the interior atoms and that makes them more volatile. So here in the image you can see um, single crystal that are used in automotive catalytic converters um, to get the uh, to get the cars to run all better and everything and you can see here that there's all kinds of edges and defects um, and often they increase the surface area to volume ratio of a catalyst just to increase the number of defects because of course a boundary or the edge is a def is considered a defect and that increases the reactivity of your um, material. This is also another reason that nanoparticles are um, such good catalysts are more chemically reactive because their surface area to volume ratio is a lot larger than macroscale materials so they have more defects. Okay, um, microscopy is used a lot in materials science um, for analysis of materials to figure out their structure and their morphology and how the processing um, is impacted by the morphology. So uh, we did a little experiment the other day um, in class where we had a um, two-dimensional crystal grown and then image between two cross polarizers and you can see the grain boundaries. So that's very similar to what's pictured here. There's a um, there's an uh, iron chromium alloy here and you can see the grain boundaries in the image. So here the grain boundaries are considered imperfections and they're more susceptible to etching. Um, so what they did to prepare this sample instead of having a um, thin section that's transparent to light and putting it between two cross polarizers, what they did was they etched the sample a little bit um, and that allowed the um, grain boundaries to be uh, revealed that way. And then they stuck it under an optical microscope and they saw the dark lines corresponding to the grain boundaries. Um, now there's a lot of standards in material science and these standards exist for the safety of the public. So the ASTM stands for the American Society of Testing in Materials, ASTM. And this um, body has established industry standards um, for different things. So if you're going to say this material is rated for use for this application, then what that means is that it's had to pass a lot of quality checks along the way. Um, we're going to learn more about the different quality checks that materials might go through as we go through the course. But one of those things that might be considered a quality check includes what is the grain size for the material that you're looking at. So one of the ASTM standards that's um, set out is to give <clears throat> the ASTM grain size number. 
So that's quantified via this little equation right here. What you do is you take an image of your material at 100 times magnification in an optical microscope and then you display it at 100 times magnification. And then you count the number of grains per square inch in your material at that 100x magnification. Okay, And then that equation here, big N is the number of grains um, per square inch, the 100x magnification, and that's equal to 2 to the power of little n minus 1, and little n here is the ASTM grain size number. Okay. So in an example problem from your textbook, this is number 34 in the version 8 of the tech material science textbook. If you have an ASTM grain size of 8, approximately how many grains would there be per square inch and a magnification of 100x? And then also how many grains per square inch would there be without any magnification in the real material, in other words, in the cross section of the real material? So to solve this, we're going to use that little equation. Big N is equal to 2 to the power of little n minus 1. If little n is 8, then that means that big N is equal to 2 to the 7th power. And 2 to the 7th power is 128 grains per square inch that would appear in that image at the magnification of 100. Now, if you remember, um, you've probably heard this before. Hopefully, I'm not telling you anything you hadn't already heard. But the magnification, as defined for a microscope, is equal to, in one dimension, the displayed length over the actual length. So if you say that you are looking at something at 100 magnification, and at 100 magnification, it's one inch in that dimension, then that means its actual dimension on the sample is 0.01 inches. Okay. So you're really looking at, at that uh, size, 0.01, square, 0.01 inches quantity squared without any magnification. Now, that means that your, your image is a factor of 10,000 magnified or, or larger than your actual. So you would have to multiply by a factor of 10,000 to find the actual number of grains per square inch with no magnification. And that would give you 1.28 times 10 to the 6 grains per square inch on the actual sample. Hopefully I didn't garble that too much and it makes sense. Now there's a number of different microscopies out there. Um, and each one of those microscopies is good for a particular job and at a particular length scale, okay? Optical microscopy isn't going to solve all your problems, neither is electron microscopy. You have to find the right tool for the right job. So there's different kinds of microscopes out there on the market now. Of course, there's your, your eye. That's one way of viewing a sample. Um, and that's good from about, say, 10 to the 5th nanometers up. You can see things. Um, and then if you use an optical microscope, typical optical microscopes can magnify things, say, up to 1,000 times. Um, and so that gives you a size scale of about um, something times 10 to the 2 nanometers. You're going to be limited by the wavelength of light, basically. Optical microscopes aren't going to be able to do better than that. Um, and the wavelength of visible light begins at 400 nanometers. So that's kind of your ultimate resolution for an optical microscope. And then that goes up from there. Um, scanning electron microscopes, this is where you have a beam of electrons um, that is then focused down to a spot. And then what happens um, is you scan the spot across the sample um, and uh, that forms an array, a, a, a two-dimensional array of data points. And the brightness of each pixel in that image corresponds to the signal that you get out created by that electron beam. That could be the backscattered electrons, the secondary electrons, the x-rays, anything that's created by that electron beam um, can be used as a signal um, and then different types of images displayed. So that's kind of scanning electron microscopy in a nutshell. Scanning electron microscopy's resolution is therefore going to be limited by the size of the spot that you can create on your sample surface. So that's going to be at best on the order of a few nanometers. Um, so that explains the lower limit on the range on scanning electron microscopy images. Transmission electron microscopes, though, there you have a thin section of material and you shoot the electrons through. So transmission electron microscopes, you're not creating a spot. So that doesn't limit your resolution. What limits your resolution in aberration corrected transmission electron microscopes is the wavelength of the electron itself as dictated by Planck's constant um, divided by the momentum. So remember for matter waves, lambda is equal to h over p, where p is your momentum. Transmission electron microscopes are actually limited um, when they're aberration corrected 
to the wavelength of the electron. So that gives you very, very low subatomic at times resolution. And then finally, scanning probe microscopes. Um, there's a couple of different kinds of those. Um, scanning tunneling microscopes, scanning, um, scanning atomic force microscopes. These are two different kinds of scanning probe microscopes. And those are going to be limited in part by the radius of your probe. Um, so it's just how sharp can you make your tip. Um, and then sometimes you can get to some fraction of the radius of your tip. They're getting good, good tip radii these days, and they've actually gotten um, tip radii on the end or the sharpness of some of the STM tips down to a single atom, um, which means that you can get subatomic resolution in the scanning probe microscopes as well. So that's pretty um, impressive. So that's your sort of in a nutshell what's going on. Please do read those sections of your textbook. And if you find microscopy particularly interesting, we do have a microscopy course um, that uh, covers this. So I encourage you to take that. One fun thing about scanning tunneling microscopy is that the atoms can be arranged um, and imaged. You can apply a field and kind of pick an atom up and move it to a new location. You might have seen the little cartoon that's out there now. It's the smallest cartoon in the world where they had these atoms that they moved around on a surface um, in a succession of images and then made a movie out of it. Um, it was, it's really cute. If you haven't seen it, um, do check it out. And then if you have an aberration corrected transmission electron microscope, then you can get, you know, true subatomic resolution. Um, they're really fantastic things. The closest one of these to us, we don't have one of these on campus. We have a transmission electron microscope, but not an aberration corrected one. Um, the closest one of these are probably in Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge National Labs or University of Tennessee Knoxville. They have some there. Um, aberration corrected just means that, you know, in an ideal optical system, all the rays of light from a point on the object plane would converge to the same point, and that forms a clear image. But of course, that, that never really happens. So you have to correct for these defects. Um, for a long time, it was very difficult to do that with an electron microscope, but to a certain degree now, they have actually overcome those difficulties. Um, and you can get resolution down to less than 0.1 nanometers, which is pretty incredible. All right, so that finishes off what I'd like to say um, about Chapter 4, and I hope you enjoyed it.